and if we can't uh, get everything finished, let me find a workaround. the server ISO. Hi, Brandon, how are you? We are going to start shortly. Just download the lab and take a look at it. You can do this one on uh, your Mac system. Okay, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. How's your download going? Is it really slow, too? Is this... No. No? Yeah, Mark's still downloading. How, how does it take how long left? It says two minutes left. Oh, really? Just went up. Why is mine so slow? I'm on, I have three it's hours okay. or two hours. Anyway, all right, yeah. so let's talk about the lab. Come on, share screen. So lovely. Okay, so we are going to do virtual machine today and we are going to do cloud on Wednesday. And cloud product we're gonna use is gonna be AWS and we are going to do EC2, which is to create a virtual machine that's gonna be server. And then I will show you how you can actually terminal into your AWS virtual machine and control it if everything works. So you should be receiving an email invitation for AWS and it, you have to create an account using your school email. It's going to take you to a Canvas shell. Um, hi. Hello. How are you doing? I'm a uh, Kyra Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to stay for the whole session? You're okay to stay for the whole yeah. session? Okay, yeah, just take a seat. We just got started. Okay. We are going to do lab six one. And when you get onto Canvas, download the lab and then we'll work through it. Okay, so as we we're saying that I I had submitted for the Canvas for AWS, so make sure that you accept it, create, register for an account so you can get a free access to AWS through AWS Academy, okay? And then I will walk you through on how to access your cloud uh, on Wednesday. I did write the tutorial or the instruction for the lab, but AWS has recently oh. modified their interface. So I have to modify some of the instructions, but this we are going to use uh, VirtualBox, which is already installed on these computer. So for those of you who are at home, you need to install VirtualBox, which is part A. Okay. And then if you do this at home, you simply go to VirtualBox and Oracle created VirtualBox. This is called a hypervisor. And a hypervisor is just a software that allows you to create and manage your virtual machine. And your virtual machine can be running any operating system that you can download ISO for, like your Windows, your Linux, different releases of Linux. You can sometimes also create VirtualBox for Mac OS, but I know Mac OS, Mac system has their own, you know, version of it where you can run some, not like dual boot, but something that's concurrent through the virtual machine. There is also a new technology called multi-pass that's used by, um, by Ubuntu and other um, organizations for 
for running virtual machines, okay? So comparable to VirtualBox, you would see another hypervisor product, which is VMware, uh, VMware Player, which is free. Now, if you download VMware Workstation, it's a trial version. It has a little bit more feature. And also, you know, it, it's basically designed for like home use or small business use. Now, if you use VMware product, you can use vSphere, which is a server where you can create different instances of virtual machines that people can connect to those virtual machines and be able to use it through thin client, which are small desktop system that doesn't have a lot of hardware, just network connection. A lot of business use this because they mainly just want to run applications. So it has small storage, a lot of RAM, you know, mouse, keyboard, and so on. Small box, okay? So, and then Microsoft version of the server is Hyper-V, and Hyper-V is very commonly used. So here's VirtualBox. If you do this at home, you have to download the version that you're using. So if you're using Mac OS, you need to download this one. If you're using Windows, you need to download this one. And then the Linux distribution, you need to download this one. And you basically read some information. But for the Windows, once it's downloaded the executable, you just run the executable to install. You already have this on your computer. OK? So after you download VirtualBox and install it, you're going to call up VirtualBox by searching for it. And I had them install this, even though it's not the latest one, but it's it will work. Okay. And so here is your virtual box. Okay. So before we get in depth with it, I want you to get started and then you can uh you can you should download, you should download your Ubuntu. Okay. As you can see on mine, it's crawling slow. So maybe I should. Cancel that and then re-download it because okay. I'm gonna put that one. That sounds like better, like ten minutes. Earlier it was like two hours. Maybe it's coming from a different server. Okay, so when you create your virtual machine, there are a few things that you're going to need. You are going to need a hypervisor. We talked about that, right? The software that you're going to use. You are going to need an ISO, which is a bootable image file that contains operating system installation file. Okay, now some ISO will work directly when you do the installation, but normally when you install on a regular desktop, you have to convert it, right? You have to unpack it into directories and folders where it would be able to read the boot file. So you would use a software like your CD burner type of software. You know, usually they will tell you uh, what kind of software that you can use for free. You don't have to really, you know, go and purchase the software. Then the third thing that you're going to need, actually four things. Third thing you're going to need is going to be some kind of storage on your computer. So if the virtual machine, if the system in virtually, if it, it's 50 gigs, it's going to run you a few gigs on a physical drive. If the virtual machine is 10 gigs, right, it's going to run you a couple of gigs. So yes, you can put this onto your USB flash drive or your, your internal hard drive, wherever that you would have the space. In order to run virtual machine, you should dedicate at least two gig of RAM on your existing system to it to at least run it somewhat decent, okay? The minimum that you can give it is 512 megabyte, but it's going to be really slow. It would be like the old Intel Core, where it would not even be dual core. You would have to wait for it when you click something, right? So that's not what we want. Okay, so on the instructions, let me go to my download, sorry. And you can download this from Canvas, okay? 
if you want to follow along. We already have VirtualBox installed in this classroom, but if you do it at home, like I said, you have to do part A, read the information. Then you are going to download Ubuntu, you need your ISO. Now, if you want to run Windows, you just need to find the Windows ISO. If you have Windows system at home, you can actually create an ISO for Windows through the, the system and the recovery process. So all you have to do is go to control panel, go into system and recovery, and then you can find where it says make an ISO, right? You can select that option or you can go download it from Microsoft. But if you do download from Microsoft, you have to download Microsoft installer, which is a software to download the ISO, right? It, it takes a while to download the installer. Anyway, so you're gonna need the ISO, whichever operating system you wanna run. Now here it tells you to use the, the stable version of Ubuntu, which is the 2004. And a few months from now, when you come back to the website, you're gonna find that there will be newer versions because they do update the versions. Sometimes they fix some of the bugs and so on, okay? So in the software itself, you always want to start, if you don't see this, you want to start with tools. Okay, so since this is the first time I'm using it on the system here, I simply, if you want to make a new virtual machine, you will click the blue star. If you already have a virtual machine in existence, you just click add. And what that will do is it's going to let you browse to where your virtual machine would be. After it creates a virtual machine, it's going to default it to my documents or documents, right? I'm sorry, I'm old. Uh, documents not my documents and then in it you would see um you would see virtual box and then it would have your virtual machine there if you just click next 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 right but we can browse and and and, and point it to where it's gonna go so when you click the add button here i'm sorry the new button what you're doing is you're creating a virtual machine then i can give it a name okay I normally just name it what what the operating system would be. So you can say Ubuntu, you know, VM or something like that. If you if you're doing this for ethical hacking classes, you might do like Kali Linux, which you download the ISO for Kali, and you would say Kali VM, or if you're using Parrot, etc. You can use Windows 10 VM, whatever you want to name it. Okay. Now, notice that this is the default folder. That's where it's going to put it, users, MVC, VirtualBox, VM, VM. But what if I don't want to put it here? What if I wanted to put it on my flash drive, right? So I'm going to click the drop down arrow and I'm going to click other, okay? I recommend that you make a folder for it. So when you need to copy it and put it somewhere, you can because, you know, Sometimes it, it gets corrupted and then you just go and you recopy it or be recreate it. So let's say that I wanted to put it on my drive, which is this one, right? I can just make a new folder and I can call it Ubuntu VM like this, okay? And once you have VirtualBox, it doesn't matter which OS you're using, the interface is pretty close. Okay, any question? Okay, so put a location where you want to put it. You can put it on your desktop or wherever you want. Okay, so it tells you here that you need to put it on your flash drive or somewhere you can find it because the computer, when you reboot it, it's gonna go away. All right, then come back here. It's gonna automatically detect that it's a 64-bit because you tell it Ubuntu, it's gonna show that. But if it doesn't match, you just need to click this and make sure you select the right OS, okay? And if it's not there, then you can choose the, the unknown, but usually they have a long list. Okay, then go next. Here is where you need to change your RAM, okay? So in this, you wanted to take the glide bar or you can change this value to 2048, but you can just pull this up, okay? So what we want is we wanna give it about two gigs, 
right there, okay? So two gigs is gonna be 2,048 megabyte. Now, why am I giving it two gigs? Well, what if you only have six in your system, right? About close to four, it's gonna be dedicated to your Windows or your OS. And then, and then the rest is gonna be for applications. Now, if I have 32 gigs of RAM, like what you have on the Alienware, you can bring it up more, okay? But sometimes it's not necessary to go a lot because I can run a lot of virtual machines by just having a lot of RAM. Okay, so we are gonna go next here. We are gonna make the virtual disk, okay? And here we can do, um, we can do a 10 gigs, but you can also modify this. So a 10 gigs is generally gonna be pretty small. We're not gonna do much to this VM, so, but you can also modify this. Okay, so we are gonna create a new virtual disk. And what it's gonna do is, when you click next, it's gonna create what's called a hard disk file. So VirtualBox uses a VDI file to load your virtual machine. When you create a virtual box, it creates this file and it would have like a blue cube icon. Now in other hypervisor like um, VMware, it would create other type of file. But the VMDK here, so ideally it works across different virtual hypervisor, virtual, uh, virtual machine hypervisor, but not always the case, right? So we are going to make a virtual box disk image and we're gonna go next, okay? So here is where I'm at, step seven. And we want it to be, it's recommended that you are doing dynamically allocated. Who knows what dynamically allocated means? So when your system tells you that it's dynamically allocating on your disk file, what does that mean? It changes the size depending on what's given. It's changing its size be, be based on what's given now or based on what's given later? later? Later, when you're using it, okay? And also when it's dynamically allocating, it's not putting in in sequential space. It's writing wherever that's available. So that is when it's pulling it, it's gonna pull it from different location and it's gonna flex it based on what's available in your space. So, and the cool thing about this is that it's not to a fixed size, so you're not dedicating a certain amount of this size to it, right? And so what it's saying here is that it will not shrink again automatically when space on that it is free. Okay, now if you wanted to do fixed size, it's gonna take a little longer. So we're gonna go dynamically allocated. And it tells me here, it's confirming that it's gonna put it on my E drive. And if you put it on, so when you look for it to run the machine, make sure that you go to that location, okay? And if you don't change the location, you just gotta go to C drive and under the folder that it tells you earlier, okay? Now on the hard disk earlier, remember it tells you 10 gig. If you want it higher, this is the time to change. So on average, I recommend that if you started doing a lot of stuff with the virtual machine, you want to go at least double of what it's giving you, you know. So if I'm doing like 20, 25 gigs, I'm roughly looking at about less than five gigs in a regular drive. But if I'm doing 50 gigs, right, because I did the, the Windows virtual machine for 50 gigs and it copies about four gigs. So it's like a fraction of what the actual physical real real size that will be. Okay, so once you have everything set up, okay, then you can click start. But I'm gonna wait here because I'm still downloading. So I'm gonna I wanna run through this so you know what this is. So look when you're looking at this in the settings, you would have everything that you need, like the BIOS like your, your device manager in Windows. So if you need to change something for the system, you would go to the orange wheel. 
which is the settings, okay? And here, what you would see is it tells you what virtual machine it is, where it's located. So if I ever forget where that is, I would go to general advanced tab, okay? And then, you know, the description, if you put it there, and then under system, that will tie to the RAM that you give it. I normally take off the floppy because it's going to give you this non-fatal error that's going to look for a floppy that never will exist. And then sometime I also take off the optical drive. But, you know, in the case that if you do use an actual optical drive for your virtual machine, then you can mount it. Okay, so, you know, these options are selected. And then if you are installing from a network, so I would have a server and distributing this image, I would select that option. And that sometimes is the case, okay? All right. So then the processor, it tells you here. Now, for those of you who get to the upper classes when you have me, for like Python for networking or some advanced networking classes, you might have a nested virtual machine. That means I run a virtual machine inside a virtual machine. And you can nest it two times, right? So that is, this is where you select it. Only the new Intel i7 later releases and the i9 is capable of doing this. If you're using i5, it doesn't allow you to do nested virtual machine. On AMD, I think they, they started sooner. So, it works best and this is why you see it. So, so for the Intel, you would see that the VTX and then the AMD is the AMDX. Now at home, you have to go to your BIOS and turn on, you have to enable, you know, the virtualization technology on your BIOS in order for this to work. Otherwise you're gonna get an error when you go through the stage. Okay, so this is where you do the nested virtual machine. And, I read the threads on see how many crazy people actually nest it more than three times, right? Uh, people said that it, it becomes crashy after three times. So you can, so you can create a virtual machine and inside it you run another virtual machine and inside it you run another vir virtual machine. And I think eventually we will have the technology where it's infinite, right? But right now, like the cap of it is that it's not able to nest it too much deeper than than three layer which is cool in my opinion. I'm just, that's kind of like a nerdy thing to do, I guess. Okay, so for display, sometimes you are gonna get an error and make sure that you change this because it's gonna tell you that it cannot do the 3D graphics, especially when you run this on your gaming machine and it's not able to interpret your driver. So what you need to do is you need to also up this Okay, your your video memory because it's only at like you know certain meg, so you can give it a little bit more juice, and then you need to enable the three D acceleration if your driver if your adapter requires that. Okay, so I'm fine with these uh, being like this. So you know, and then storage you already see that. Okay, so it's gonna put it on my SATA drive and then the audio network is important. So this right now, it uses network address translation, which allows it to take the private IP from the inside the network and then bring it to the outside of the network. Sometimes we want to, for the system to mimic the actual physical host system. So your physical, your Windows 10 is the host system, the virtual machine. So you can bridge the adapter in that it would, it would be able to copy the configuration from your machine. If you want it only host adapter, that means that it's only gonna be for that, for the physical host, it's not, it's gonna keep it isolated. So there are options here. So we keep it at net right now, okay? And then those are the ports. So if you wanted to add USB to copy files and things, you can add it and then see if it's able to detect it, only depending on the software driver, okay? All right, so you see how the settings work, and then I'm gonna go ahead and click start. And now it's gonna look for my ISO. 
Okay, so click the browse and then click the add and then go to your downloads and then get your Ubuntu. Okay, again, once I click start, I'm gonna click add and then go to downloads and then find my ISO. So at this point, you're mounting the, the, the location that you have your bootable image. Okay? And then you gotta click it, make sure that it's blue, and then choose. Okay, and then we're gonna start it. You can make as many virtual machines as you like. Sometimes if you're unhappy, or let's say my students, before they will forget their password, <laughs> and then they'll just make another virtual machine. <laughs> okay, so it's gonna do its thing. First, it's gonna check for the drive that it's gonna write the file system to, right? And then it's gonna see if there's any kind of error. Now, the cool thing about VirtualBox is that it's able to detect your mouse inside and outside. Anytime that you have issues with the mouse and keyboard, always click on the input at the top, okay? You can tell, like, you know how you, you need to pre press those combo hotkeys or the control and whatever, right? That's where you're gonna be able to control that. On VMware, it's not as intuitive. I think in, in on this interface, this part of the interface, um, the VMware player compared to this. So if you, yeah, if you, I, yeah, I was, I was originally trained on VM, VMware with Dell, um, and and I was certified with vSphere, but now like I transition, I start to like VirtualBox more now that they are making the application way better. I think for free, right? But VMware, their products, their proprietary products is beautiful and, and you, you, you know, it's one of the best companies to work for actually technology-wise. So if you ever can get a job there, do, do it, right? All right. So here is where it's going to, so we're going to select English and then we're going to go install Ubuntu. And then we are going to select English and English again, right? And because if you select other form of keyboard, you're going to find that your symbols are going to interpret differently, even though if you choose like English UK, you see this with Raspberry Pi. Okay, then we click continue. And then we are going to do a normal installation. We are going to push updates because Linux likes their updates and updates would also allow different features. <laughs> Okay, and then just go continue. Now on other Linux version, you have to actually mount your, your drive partitions. Otherwise, right, you have to create the DBA zero and other drives. So like Fedora and, and Red Hat, you have to do those because they are different releases. So Linux have many different variations. There's the Debian family, which is what you see with Kali, Ubuntu, Raspberry Pi. And then you have other releases like CentOS and SUSE and Red Hat and so on, where some of the commands are the same, but the majority of the commands are different. Their interfaces are different. Desktop slightly different, you know, and so on. All right. So I'm, I am going to go ahead and choose erase this and install Ubuntu. It tells you this is because, you know, if you have something on there, you gotta make sure that you get that out before you do this part. So we are gonna click install now. And here is where it actually format your drive for you. So it's telling me that it's cutting two sections of that drive that I gave it earlier, which is about 25 gigs. It's gonna put one is the SE3 um, and then the other one is the SCSI 3. So most operating system will call this as SDA. And on Linux, it uses, uh, on the Debian Linux, I should say, it uses EXT4, which is its file system, okay? 
this is just the way that it organizes the file. The type of file system tells the operating system how it would organize the file. Like in Windows, it would use NTFS or FAT, you know, EXFAT or, or, or different type of FAT. And those are also different type of file system. Okay. Then click continue. And then it's going to go. So here is where your region and language. So it's telling me that I'm here in Los Angeles. That's fine. We'll continue. And then here is where we're going to put our name. You can put your name. I'm just going to put student. And then make sure that we put in a password. So I'll just put CIS25 and then a symbol. Something that you can remember and strong enough, right? Okay, if you if you like to log in automatically, you can select this. I don't. I usually just use the default. So never have your system remember so much stuff. Okay, so then it's gonna go for a few more minutes. So it's gonna copy files, it's gonna write the files. And in my opinion, Ubuntu is the easiest one to do this with, to learn with, to start. Okay, Kali is slightly different in that you do have to, you know, the interface of it is not as nice. You're gonna have like to select mouse in some, or keyboard in some options before it actually mounts with this uh, and so on. So here we're going to wait a few minutes. And for those of you who are still working on catching up, we are doing lab 6-1. And the steps are written there. You don't have to do part A if you're doing this in class. You just start with part B. But for those of you who are at home, you are doing A to start. All right. So once we have the, the OS started, we, we are going to use the terminal, which is the command line. And command line is going to be our best friend because it's the easy to use if we know how to use it. So I want you to practice using command line. Okay. All right. So let's wait on this. So let's preview. So I did this and then I had install, I choose English, I chose update, I wrote the, for the entire disk, I chose the time zone, which is Los Angeles. I created the username and password. So this is gonna take about 10 to 15 minutes. Once it's finished, it's gonna restart and it's gonna ask you to log in with the password that you created, okay? Then you are going to open up terminal by opening up show apps. And then you are going to use some of the command that's shown here. Okay, and we'll talk about those. Any questions? You can use control T to open it too. Yes. And then instead of putting it on there, just always copy it, just put it on the desktop. desktop. So you can always copy it, okay? Yeah, for those of you who put it on the computer, you can always copy it as long as you know where the location is. Yep, question? Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's see updates and updates. Go back. Hey. Chill 
So now you just go forward. Yep. Okay. The question is, why do we need to do this, right? Well, you can you can simulate a lot of different OSs for testing purposes. You can run application inside an application, which is you can run application inside your virtual machines. And we can actually, most data center uses virtual machines instead of the actual physical system. So I might have a hundred server and I can run, I can run 10 virtual machine on each of the server, which gives me a thousand logical server on a regular 100 server. So it definitely saves me money in the long run, 
right? A, a lot of data center does that, including Facebook, right? Google, all of them, okay? So virtual machines are definitely useful and make it efficient for us to operate in the technical area. You can you you can do some kind of mining application. Not recommended because mining already utilizes a lot of resources. Yeah, and creating a virtual machine also takes. Yeah, so. So using virtual machine takes up a lot of RAM, so you're better off running it straight from the system. But you can definitely test some kind of mining application on a virtual machine, right? So it's really good for, for if you want to be efficiently saving some money, you can run virtual machine. Every business uses virtual machine. So here, right, I'm going to go ahead and do mouse integration. And so oh, that's, that takes a while, I know. So after it finishes, it's going to ask you to click in it or press enter. You can press enter. And then it's basically in the regular machine, that's when we remove the USB or the CD that we used to do the installation. Yeah, now, now Ubuntu, you can also make a live USB on the website. It walks you through how to do that. Um, I made my CIS 27 class last year and right before COVID they did it. And you can plug it into any computer to run your Ubuntu. So there are many ways that you can do this. So here, once I'm done, I'm gonna go ahead and click student, and then I type in my password that I created. Okay, and then you can always close these little messages. It's just telling you that you can do the pointer integration and so on. So this is where, you know, it's going to want your online account. You can click skip. And then do you want to do live patch? I normally do this, but you can always do it through command line by doing sudo app get install update. So this, if you do select this, this is going to take like a few more minutes. And then as you are a regular user, even though, you know, you could be an administrator, but anything that's not root, root is like equal to Linux administrator, it's going to ask for password for any kind of installation. Okay. No, I don't want this. Oh, let me use go next. Show a report, yes, and go next. And then you can turn on your privacy or not. It's up to you. And you're ready to go. Okay. So here it's going to tell you that it's already having updates. Like I said before, we're going to go ahead and click install now. Or we can use the command line for that. So this, that takes a little bit. Moses tell us that we can use the control T or you can go in here. This is like Windows start button kind of, this is for all apps. Wait, professor. Yes. And say by operating system, but like Apple has its own operating system, right? Yes. Has its own operating system. Can someone create their own operating system? Yes. And it's you can use something like like free BSD, uh -huh. which is a form of Linux or Unix system. So, and Mac OS is a form of Unix system. It's derived from Unix. Windows originally came from also that that type, but Microsoft has branched off and and redesigned their OS. But yes, someone can create OS, but the 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 development for OS is complex. So you can use a package that's already been made and then modify it. 
and improve it, okay? So that's why you see a lot of different Linux releases because it's open source and so developer would use packages and they would make it. So sometimes they look kind of similar. <clears throat> all right, so browser, all the things that you need here. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up terminal. Okay, and then in my terminal, it's always gonna tell me who I'm logging as and what system I'm on. Okay, now the root is gonna be your administrator. You should never use root unless it's absolutely necessary. You can create user account, but the account that you create is not it's not a root user. So every time that you're trying to install something, it's going to prompt the password. But you have to use a command called sudo for stuff, right? For, for to issue other commands. And sudo stands for super user do. That's going to elevate the user account that you have to be a super user, which has more privileges in the system. So in a system, there are different areas of control. Privileges pertain to system rights. And system rights are, you know, system related, shutting down, you know, installing application, running updates. Permission pertain to objects, which are files, folders, directory, etc. So I see people mix them up all the time. Don't mix up the permissions with, with system rights or privileges, okay? So. I did that once. <laughs> all right. So once I'm in here, are you guys there yet or no? Yeah. Okay. All right. You can. See if I can get out of my foot. Okay. Sorry. I'm trying to move above. So in your lab, you are going to go to the command, and I think you have what is that? You name. And you can always make your profile. So let me see if I can make it a little larger. So under preferences, you can change this. You can add a new profile, right? And then you can make your, your, your font and your backdrop color, whatever that you want, your size, okay? Go custom font and I want to go larger so you can see. Well, are you trying to put another desktop on it? Uh, no, I did that, but. Uh... No, on the other one, on the Ubuntu, I installed Nextcloud on it, and it says, says there's not enough space for it. <laughs> Wait, guys. Uh, don't want okay. okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to have to delete it then. It's not releasing my mouse, and I can't get it to input. The, yeah, I, it, it, it won't release my mouse right now. I know I forgot. I, I clicked something and it's not. All else failed. You got to get over to control alt delete. <laughs> so you press control alt delete, it halts everything. All right. 
So now we're going to do you name, uh, you name dash a because it captured my mouse and it would not let re you release. So in here, you name dash a all that is is it's going to give you the kernel that's going to store the OS and we will spend a you know in the future weeks talking about kernel and OS. And so you would be able to look at your um, resource allocation for your OS, even though it's virtual, it should be able to give you that. Okay. And if you're not sure, you can always do you name space slash question mark, which is the help option. Okay, so it says click the mouse inside the virtual machine, press and capture right control. Post is currently defined as right control. You said click cancel? Yes. Okay. No, it won't let me do that. Oh, why is uh, it click capture? I yeah. I but then I have to click right control, I think. All right. So you name dash A. So it tells me here that I am inside the system. This is the release version, right? And this is when it's installed. So take a screen capture. Print screen. So you name dash a gives you the kernel information where the OS sits. Okay. And then what's the next one? Let's see. Let me see. Sorry, guys. Let me. Let me pull my work over to my right side and then I will do this on here so I can see and all right looking at your lab after you take the screenshot for number 22 you are going to put in DS mesh or D M E S G okay and I'm sorry pseudo D M and what you're doing with the arrow is that what you're doing here is you are going to look, create a boot log, okay? A dot log file that contains, that contains any kind of error that it has at the startup. So it's gonna prompt you the password. You just gotta put it in again. So nothing is happening there, but that log exists. If it doesn't throw any error, it created a log. Why am I creating a startup log? Well, because when your system boot, Linux is really good at doing inventory of all its file and things that it can and cannot run. All OS does that. But what you want to do is you want to create a log to keep track of all those, those active things and inactive things or failed things, okay? And logs is important. It's going to tell us what's wrong with our computer. Okay. So once you create the log, you are going to open it up by using a cat command. And anytime that you, you want to access a file, as long as it exists in the location that you're using it, you would be able to open it up. And I'm using a pipe that grab error. All that is, is it's going to search for error. When you do a grep, it's going to find. It's not there's fine and finger, but you know, grep is to search. Cat allows you to look at the actual file, but we don't want to look at the entire file. It might be very large and has yeah. a lot of stuff we don't need. So you would do a grab error to look for a certain keyword, okay? So that's what I get. So I have a couple errors there. So I wanted to see what's wrong with it. It could be some time uh, memory error, right? It looks like it is right here. Yep. Yeah, so it tried to write to a certain location and then it's not able to do that. So it remounted to another location.
Any question? So if you have Mac OS at home and you create a virtual machine, you should be able to do this because now you're in Linux, right? The pie, you mean, <laughs> is under backspace, but you're going to hit, you see it under, under backspace button. Oh, okay. Yeah. You shift and then you click. Right, right. Yeah, it's okay. There's no dumb question. No, 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 me, me. Yeah, so what we're doing is when you're using, when you piping, what you're doing is you're giving it an additional option, right? You're saying that I'm opening up the file and I'm adding in another command called to search for whatever the keyword would be. All right, so I'm teaching you this. So later on, if you, you can wow employers, right? You can say, I know how to use Linux. I've used Ubuntu command line. I know how to open up file and do this. All right. On the next one, you are going to, what kind of error do you see? Okay. Then uh, you are going to do an, a sudo ls mod. And you are going to, you're going to point it, the arrow just redirect it to lsmod.log, right? Oops, I'm dyslexic a little bit. So I type things backwards sometimes. <laughs> All right, so I, I am gonna use the command and put it into a log file, <clears throat> okay? And then after that, you know, you can take a look at what that log file is, again, by using cat, right? Okay, I'm sorry, but I gotta, Control, let's say control, right? It did do that last time. Okay. Okay. Um, so after that, I'm at step 26. Then I'm going to go ahead and do cat ls mod.log grep hda. Okay. Cat ls mod.log. And then I'm going to pipe it do a grep HDA. That means I'm searching for HDA in LS mod. So what does LS mod do, right? It tells you right there that you can use it to load any kind of modified files within the kernel because when it loads the OS, likely that it would have some kind of the loaded files that would be modified, okay? And then, Okay. Oh yeah, that means it didn't have anything. So that's okay. You can take the screen capture. When I did this on my other, my other Ubuntu that I use for my programming class, it showed some stuff. But that is because we installed a bunch of things on there. Um, okay. Then you are going to look at a list of USB devices on number thirty. Okay. And then, so I would do a, what is that? Pseudo LS USB, right? And then redirect it to the file, which is lsusb.log. And if you don't know a, a, a certain program that uh, you know. Certain command? Oh, yeah, you could just put man, and then it'll show up like right. the information about it. What's man start saying for M-A-N, manual, right? Yeah. Yeah, man stands for manual, and you can if you're not sure. That's what's great about Linux too is that so you can get a lot of help information. <laughs> All right, then after we we created the lot the LS USB, we're gonna do a cat LS USB dot log. Okay, so it tells me here that I it does have a bus O one and O2, so it has a bus O1 device two and a bus O1 device one, and it gives you the ID number. All, um, all communication ports or all types of ports have some kind of identification, and it's a way for the system to recognize what path it's using or the bus it's using, right? Think of it like a highway where it will transfer data. So it tells me that it would have VirtualBox, USB tablet, Linux Foundation 1.1 Root Hub, and Root Hub is commonly found in all OSs. 
What? I have a syntax error. Yes. This is my thing earlier. Now it doesn't. All right. Let's go. Sorry. I got to go here and I got to scroll down. Okay. Then we are going to do the IP address. The IP address one, and we want to put that into IP address lock. So on the newer Linux releases, INET uh, or ifconfig doesn't work anymore. They disabled that package a long time ago. So you are going to use IP address. This is a way that we can get your IP information, including your physical address of your system. And we are going to put it onto. Now you don't have to make it a dot log file, right? You can make it a dot text file. You can make it, you know, whatever file that you want to be able to, to retrieve. Okay. So there I have, I put it onto the dot log and again, I can go in and open it up. I, I'm sorry, I think, oh yeah, I put it all in one. You can also open it up with Nano. Yes, Nano is an editor, but you have to install I Nano. Like, I like JP Edit better. Or Vim. Because it has a user interface. <laughs> That's just me. JP Edit? You yeah, can put Sublime on it too. Yeah. All right, so here, how can you tell what's an IP address? Your INET address? is this, this is link, this is given to your ethernet adapter. Linux and um, Mac OS uses INET, okay? That's your IP address, okay? And then your link, your, your, this is gonna be for broadcast, it uses this. And then your link local for the IPv6, it uses this. Okay, for those of you, I think there's one or two of you in here that takes my 40A, so. Make sure loop back up here. So this is your IP configuration information that comes from your network interface card. Any question? So whenever you're trying to troubleshoot a connectivity problem, right? We wanted to look at the IP address. We can also, you can use ping and then the IP address like the, the 10.0.2 right here. Yours is similar. We'll have a different value there. Okay, let me go and okay, so then you are you already look at the IP address log. You and you make sure you answer the question on on number 33. How many INET entries did you find? Okay, how many IP version 4 address? And you wanted to take a look at that one that I highlighted. Only like one, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it sees only one, but on the outside there are more because it sees the virtual one. Okay. Oh, yeah. Then we are gonna make a directory. So we're now gonna move into the desktop environment. So so we are gonna do CD desktop, but Linux is case sensitive, so you have to type it as it is known to the so all of the all of the area that you're going to go into their folders or directory so we're going to do a cd desktop and once you're in it you're going to see that it's going to put it into the blue so that means it's your current active direct your 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 your, your current directory that you're using that's a folder that you're in okay so cd stands for change directory we're moving into that folder and then we are going to make a folder call. So you're going to use a make there, make a directory called CIS25. Okay. And Windows uses the same command make, make there is make directory, right? And then we are going to use a touch command. And the touch command allows us to make different files so once you're making the directory you're going to move into it so cd cis 25 right otherwise 
you just make it on the outside. We wanted to put it in that folder. Then we are gonna use touch file one dot txt, whatever the file name that you want. And then you can make another one, file two dot txt, and then press enter. So you can do many files at once. So touch command allows us to make empty files, okay? We can go in and we can edit it later with Nano or another text editor. Okay. All right. Then now we're going to use Nano. So we're going to do sudo app get install Nano. Those of you who took my Java class, right? I do a lot of stuff in command line. <laughs> So you learn to program in command line. You don't need all that extra IDE stuff. All right. So um, I already have the, the Nano installed. I just want to make sure that I have it. Then you're going to call up Nano by typing in Nano and then the file name, file1.txt. So when you do nano file1.txt, it's gonna open up the file. It's like we open up the file and then you can say, this is test one. And then do control X to exit. And it's gonna ask you, do you wanna save? You wanna click yes. Y, press Y. So here, what we're doing is you have to press enter for it to save the same file name again, okay? Now, if you, if you press your arrow key up, that repeats the same command, the arrow key down, it goes forward, right? So arrow key up, always go back to the previous command. I'm, I just wanna show you, you don't have to do this, right? That's what I, I did. That's what I wrote into that file and then control X, since I didn't modify it, it doesn't ask me to save. Okay, that's how you can use nano, which is a text editor to modify your file. Okay, then we are going to repeat the same process for the next file. So nano file two dot txt. Say this is test two. And then hit control X to save. Press Y, yes, and then enter to save the same name. So this is test two, right, for the second file. Okay. Any question? Yes. Control X, control X together, press again. You have to press. Oh, sorry. And then press enter. Uh-huh. Control X is to exit. And if you change it, it's going to ask you to save. You say yes and then enter. Okay. So we made file two. We modify it. Sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't work which is really annoying. All right, let me scroll down on this side. Okay, then we are going to open up the first file using cat. So I showed you that you can use nano to modify your file. Then you are going to use your cat command and then do file1.txt. Okay, so cat doesn't open up the file. Cat reads the content of the file in text and give that to you. You see that? Earlier, how it reads and you, you, you know, so if, if you have a very large file and if you want to search for a certain keyword, you would do cat and then file name and then grep, right? Hide grep and then the keyword. And there you go, okay? All right, then take a screen capture at this point for number 44. And then I'm going to use another command to make a file. But in this one, I can create a file and append text to it. Okay? So it's, it's going to be echo. So we are going to use an echo command. So we're going to do echo. And we are going to put in the text. This is test three 
make sure you put it in quotation mark, and then direct it to file three dot text. So echo creates a file and append string or text in the quotation mark to that file. Okay. So now you can go, you can open up file three and see. So read the content. So cat file three dot txt and it should say this is test three. Okay. We good? Okay, so three ways to make a file. Okay. All right. Now, since we're in the folder, we want to use ls means list. And list gives you all the content of that folder that you're in. So if you're in a folder and you want to see how many files, what files you have, right? It should show you the files there. So I made file one, file two, and file three in the CIS 25. So I have three files. Okay, take a screen capture for number 47 and answer the question. Okay, so now we're almost done. Okay, so what I want to show you is I want to uh, get into the copy. So, all right. So we are going to copy those files that we have, and we're gonna put it into the TMP folder, which is a temp file. Now Linux, some folder, you cannot just throw things in there, okay? I just wanted you to know, if you're trying to put it under home, it's not gonna want you to just put things in there. There's certain protected folder, directory, there are certain things that you cannot copy to, okay, because of privileges. So, so CP, root yeah, root will let you do it. System will let you do it, but you can't just do it right. out of the blue. File1.txt, file2.txt, and CP is just copy, okay, and then file3.txt, and then we want to go to the folder TMP. So that's step 48. So what you're doing is you're copying those files and you pay, you're pasting it to the TMP folder. And then next we are gonna do CD slash TMP. We wanna see if it's there. Okay, so now we're in this TMP folder after we use the CD command. And then you want to do LS again. So out of, see, they're here, see that? With all the other stuff too, but you know, you get the point. Okay, so answer the question after you have copy your file, take a screen capture and paste it. And then when you do a CD command, it takes it you all the way back to your home directory, which is the original location where you started. You don't have to go there. You can shut down in your current directory, but I want to show you how you can use CD. So CD to a folder, you just put the, put the path of that folder or CD by itself takes you back to the home directory, which is where you started when you opened up your terminal, okay? And we have to get better at command line because in the IT world, in the technical world, mostly everything is in the command line. Okay. And then if you want to shut down, you just do a shut down now because in Linux, if you just do shut down, it counts down the seconds before it shuts it down. And then, so if you do shut down now, it's going to boot down your machine and close everything and you're good to go. And that concludes my Linux virtual machine session. Okay, and then you can close out your, your virtual box, save your answer. Okay, if you wanna copy that virtual machine over to your drive, if you have space, you can. If not, you know how to make it. You can make it anytime at home now.
right? So if you want to learn more about Linux, make a virtual machine and learn it. If you want to learn about, you know, Windows, make a virtual machine and learn it, okay? So you don't have to, you know, buy all of these extra systems. You can have two, three of them and you can run them concurrently. All right, so when we're done, make sure that we submit it on Canvas, okay? And then if you miss when you, you came in, um, I did send out an AWS classroom invitation for the Foundation Cloud Lab. Please check your student email and, and create your register for the account through that link that they give you. I will uh, modify the, the instructions for Wednesday. We are going to do a cloud AWS lab, which is really cool because I'm going to show you how you can terminal into your own virtual machine on AWS server and be able to control it there instead of using it here. And then next week, we are only going to meet on Wednesday, except for one Wednesday that I have the 20th of October, I have a meeting which you guys might not be impacted. My five o'clock class will be impacted. So um, I will let you know further. But, and then on Monday, since we have that day, you know, not doing lab, we are going to take the, the practice test for CompTIA. So I will, I will post that starting next week and I'll put it in the announcement, but okay. All right. Once we submit, you are free to go. Okay. And you make sure that we shut down the computer and take our USB. And I'll be around until nine in case you have questions or concerns, or you want to work on other things that you didn't get to complete. Okay. Yeah. But make sure we read the chapter, chapter four, and then I'll post the video so you can do your assignments. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anybody have any questions on Zoom? Brandon? No? Richard? No? Sorry, I can't hear you. I'm, my, my input is a little weird in this room. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. If you're finished, have a good night. There's snacks for those of you who came in. There's about a lot of sweets today because it's really hard to get stuff at the staters near here because it looks like everybody cleaned them out. I went in there at like 3 p.m. today and like the shelves were all empty, no chips, uh, nothing. Good night. Okay, have a good night, everybody. Okay, enjoy. Get some rest. I'll see you Wednesday. <laughs> Any questions or stuff on anything? Just throughout the week. As long as you submit it by Sunday of the week, I'm fine. Yeah, it says in class because I used I used to teach this class like in physical class before COVID, and but because we just can't do a hundred percent in class, so and I want to use the lab time in that I can help answer questions or use the physical equipment. So yeah, every all the assignments are due Sunday. And then. We need our own USB. Oh, I have, I give you one. Oh. Yeah, I usually give the student one when they come the first day. But if I haven't seen you, I'll pop up. Yeah, I have, um, <laughs> you never know when you need a webcam, you know, nowadays. Yeah. So, usually the procedure to come into class is plug in the USB to like. Well, I, 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 yeah, basically, I just give the student a USB in case they need to save things because when oh. the computer turns off, it wipes everything.
Oh. Like, his computer doesn't save anything that you put on it. On it. Oh. So if you want to save your work, what color do you want? Please oh. color. Um, so if you have your work, instead of re-downloading and typing it, you can just put it on your USB and then take it home with you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's yours to keep, okay? Okay. Thank you. Yep. Good night. Good night. Hey, you're welcome.